Hey guys, back with the last video on Thorstein Veblen. So in the last video we talked about how this um, division of the economy into industry and business is driven by a bunch of people who want to be able to show off their wealth through conspicuous consum consumption and conspicuous leisure. Um, that's the theory of the leisure class. Um, so here in our last video, we're going to talk about the solution, which is going to be revolution, although not the revolution that Marx um, believed in. Um, but first, we have to get to what Veblen identifies as sort of, um, I don't know, I, I don't think I would say the crux of the problem. I think the crux of the problem is this idea of invidious comparison between people. But um, it's facilitated at least, and maybe comes into being because of uh, what he calls the price system. Just as Marx talked about capitalists being constrained by the capitalist system, he says business leaders, Veblen, I'm sorry, says business leaders are constrained by the price system. When we talk about prices, um, the price system, what we're talking about is uh, it's basically the market economy. The idea that what is going to determine who gets what is the price that people can make. Um, Veblen says that the price system in, in a, an economy that's driven by prices, um, you need to maintain prices that a reasonable profit can be earned. Um, the problem again is that industrial system is so productive because of the industrial arts that um, if, the, if industry is allowed to just produce, it's not going to produce enough to make a good profit. Or I'm sorry, it is going to produce so much that uh, there will be so many cheap goods that that uh, business will not be able to make a big profit. Because remember, industry is about meeting people's needs, according to Veblen. So as a result, the uh, business leaders have to sabotage it in one way or another so that they can keep production relatively low and prices relatively high. Um, that he says that these these incentives are built into a system um, based on prices. So it's this is part of the market economy. The market economy is going to create this. What's his solution? He says it's a revolution of engineers. And so this is the this is basically what he his argument is. Um, he says the working class are not going to be helpful to us here. They are going to be caught up in trying to uh, in trying to get the the stuff that will impress whoever's at their strata of things. He didn't have any hope that the working class were going to develop any class consciousness. He said, look, we've got relatively cheap goods. They can afford whatever that they can afford, and they're going to be comparison to, comparing themselves not to the richest people, but to the people who are just above them or just at about their level. You can still have that invidious comparison competition even among relatively poor people. He said the only people who have, uh, who could possibly develop a class consciousness that could take down this whole system are the production engineers. So listen, I know, but that's what he said. He said, he, he focuses, this is his argument, and then we can talk about the problems with it. Um, he said, technologists, the people who are designing uh, the, the, they're not working in the, uh, in the actual manufacturing, but they're designing the whole manufacturing system. The people who, the industrial arts, that knowledge base is theirs. They have an incentive in letting it run as well as possible. They're invested in that. Um, they want to eliminate obstructionism, wastefulness. They want to get rid of everything that's about business and just allow industry to work as well as it can. Um, and he says, look, this is more hopeful than the working class revolution that Marx talked about too, because there aren't that many people involved in this technological level of industry. He said, you get 1% of the population, maybe, to go on strike. We're not going to design your industrial stuff anymore. The whole thing collapses. They, business leaders would have to deal with them. That's Veblen's argument. I'm trying to make it as passionately as I can. 
the problem and a problem that he's criticized for is he acts as though these technologists are not, these engineers are not also living lives where they're trying to impress other engineers or anybody else in their social strata. He acts as though this idea, this theory of the leisure class doesn't apply to these people. Now, I think he's got an okay argument. I Obviously, I've just shot a huge, it wasn't me, somebody, uh, critics of him shot huge holes in this. But I also do kind of think that if you had a bunch of people who were very virtuous, who were there to try to get things to work as well as they could, and they could unite, it's theoretically possible. Um, that said, he wrote his stuff a hundred years ago and it didn't happen. So there are obviously problems. All right. That ends us with Veblen though. He's, he is finding an ultimate cause in the price system as well as our desire to compare ourselves with each other. And he finds an ultimate solution, the revolution of, of the engineers. Um, the thing that I like about Veblen, two things, I guess. Uh, first of all is his ability to not be blinded by the way we conventionally, conventionally see things. I love the fact that when he looks at the economy, what he sees are not corporations competing against each other. He sees a whole bunch of people waking up, leaving their houses, going to factories or farms and producing a whole bunch of stuff. That's an equally valid way of thinking about this. The difference between, um, between capitalism and socialism isn't the stuff that people are doing. It's our way of understanding the stuff that they're doing. If everybody were to decide tomorrow, and I'm not advocating for socialism, there are problems with it. Um, but if everybody were to decide, hey, you know what? As of tomorrow, we're not going to, we're not going to pay million dollar salaries to the vice president of marketing of whatever corporation. If we all just decided that tomorrow, it wouldn't happen anymore. So Veblen's way of, of looking at society uh, without the prejudices of our conventional ways of looking at it, I think is a really, really useful way of looking at things. The other thing he does is I feel like he takes us a step, and I don't mean to be insulting to anybody that's come before, but he takes us a step toward real modern life. It's not super fair of me to say that. I mean, Weber is definitely looking at rationalization. Zimmel is looking at, um, at the metropolis. He's looking at objective culture. He's looking at these things that are really part of our lives also. But Veblen, Veblen's, the difference between Veblen and Marx to me is the difference between a person who was writing about a world that is not that familiar to me and a person who's writing about a world that is very familiar to me. Um, and so I like that. I feel as though he is at least a step into writing about the contemporary world. Um, again, no disrespect to these other geniuses that we've already covered. All right, that's it for today. Uh, and that's it for this week. I will see you next week where we are going to dive in to um, basically what we've dealt with up to now, with the exception of Harriet Martineau in week one, is a bunch of white men who are geniuses, but who are representing a very particular, uh, a particularly privileged perspective. Um, they didn't have to deal with, uh, that's not entirely true, Georg Zimmel's Jewish. Um, so they're, they're definitely people who are dealing with some degree, and I guess it's no coincidence, he comes up with concepts like the stranger, a person who is distant, but yet still a part of things. So I guess I'm undercutting my perspective. We're going to deal just specifically with W.E.B. Du Bois and Charlotte Perkins Gilman, a black man and a woman, and wh what we are going to be able to gain and learn about society from their perspectives. So I will see you then next week.